Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 51st week of 2017. I'm Carl Osterbrook. For more than a quarter century, this program has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media, first on a so-called community radio station and now via Urbana Public TV and YouTube. Our program's name, News from Neptune, comes from Noam Chomsky, who's been writing sensible things about U.S. politics for half a century. Chomsky says in the U.S. media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Tonight, David Green and I will try to say some true things, with thanks to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, for research. No's notes are posted on the blog, newsfromneptune.com. In an Xmas gift for the rich edition of News from Neptune, I refer to the signing of the tax bill uh, that has been occupying uh, the normal news, so to speak, uh, all week. We try to bear in mind the murdered Rosa Luxemburg's remark from a century ago, the most revolutionary thing one can do is always to proclaim loudly what is happening. And George Orwell, in the suppressed preface to Animal Farm, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. We have uh, a number of things like that tonight, I think. David, what's on your list? Well, as you can see, I don't have anything ah. on my list, oh, well, okay. but I brought it in It's a anyway. holiday, after all. Yeah, but I do have a couple of, of you know, ideas. Okay. Which, well, well the, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to actually quiz you on can you tell me the other seven countries besides Israel and the the United States that voted voted against the UN UN resolution condemning Trump's um, re recognition of, of Jerusalem as the capital of of, of Israel Honduras Guatemala okay. Palau uh, the Togo Islands uh, I'm I forget the little ones. Well, there's the you've got the four you've got the four southeast right. the, the four uh, South Pacific Islands, right. the Marshall Islands, Marshall Islands, uh, uh, micro, Micronesia, Micronesia. Uh, Paulu, Paulu, I and to Paulu and Nauru, I think it is. Yeah, yes. And so those are four, and then mm -hmm. there's and then Gua and you were right, Guatemala, Honduras, which aren't usually identified with voting pro-Israel, but there's. They probably well, have their reasons for doing that. A and coup those, in Honduras got, yes, got, got them got yeah, their government they doing what the U.S. had in mind. Got their attention yeah, exactly. And then Togo, actually, it's not Togo Islands, but just the country, right. the African country of of, of Togo. Togo. Yes, I, so you that kind was of mistake. got your right. you got your Marshall Islands crossed with your <laughs> to, with your Togo. So uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, uh, but you did must be well. the holiday. I thought I'd surprise you. Actually, I wasn't I wasn't expecting to find that in the New York Times article about mm -hmm. that. But actually, if you read down far enough, they actually did tell you the nine countries, which uh, somebody else mentioned um, comprise one, approximately 1% 1 of the glo global population. Oh, um, yeah. And not that uh, there were, there were something like 90 countries who supported this, this, this you know, re you know, resolution. And there were many. There was thirty odd countries who abstained from from voting or weren't present or something like that. So it, it wasn't maybe quite as overwhelming as it looked. But of course, it 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 brought on Nikki Haley's uh, sort of churlish response about you know uh, our sovereign rights, uh, you know the the United States sovereign rights to uh, violate in, in, you know inter international law, so on and so forth. But I guess that's old business and really isn't a much consequence at this point. Well, it's just another example. The U.S. always votes with 1%. It just happened to be yeah. a different 1% this yeah. time, huh? Yeah. The, the, so, but it, it's, it's partly typical. Um, Canada yeah, I was just, Canada yeah. abstained, I mm -hmm. think, as opposed to sometimes they vote with the you know, United States. But Canada... From the depth of their liberalism, they yeah, abstained. Yeah, yes. Canada does not ever actually oppose U.S. Literally oppose U.S. policy exactly. regarding regarding Israel in in the UN or in in any other context that I know of. But the rest of the world does. Yeah, but what I thought I would do, since this came in the ma mail yesterday and seemed timely, what with it being the the season of of charitable giving, 
Uh, Counterpunch is is promoting a book called, called called Against Charity by Daniel Raventos and Julie Wark, W A R K W A R K, uh, which is blurred by Mike Davis, a well known uh, mm -hmm. a well known scholar of um, various things. Of your uh, part of the country, uh, out of my part of the country, right. actually, the you know he teaches at UC Riverside or or one of those one of those places. But anyway, the, he blurbs the book, and the, the, the longer blurb about the book, or the summary of the book, is, goes as follows. Charity, charity is not a, 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 a gift. Gift-giving implies reciprocity, an ongoing, ongoing relationship. When requital is impossible, the act of giving remains outside mutual ties, and charity becomes yet another manifestation of class structure a sterile, one-way act upholding the status quo. Vacuuming up all the profits thanks to a weak labor movement, lower taxes and tax havens, the glo global elite then turn around and remake the world in their own image with char charitable donations that speak more of mean-spiritedness spiritedness than generosity. Postmodern versions of 19th century charity aim to keep wealth and power in a few hands, mocking our, our desire for greater in, in income, income equality. So that is, again, the book Against Charity. And it's timely for me because I've been sort of critical. While I, I support charity of the kinds that I give to, <laughs> the reason I don't support charity, quote unquote, in terms of like, I don't know, the University of Illinois, Illinois Foundation, mm -hmm. which is on a charitable fundraising drive mm -hmm. of to collect $2.5 billion. You know that they're not going to collect $2.5 billion a dollar at a time from people like me. They're going to do it hundreds of thousands or millions at a time from people who want something returned for that. And as I wrote earlier this year in criticizing some of the people who are identified with that with that you know foundation, which also houses something called the um, capitalism and uh, academy on right. capitalism and, and lim limited government, which is a sort of a a, a right libertarian think tank. Um, it, it's come to my to my to my purview that uh, chari charity, uh, you know, they're 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 probably talking about other. More prominent scams like the the Clinton Clinton Foundation, or even the the Gates Gates Foundation. You know that these people vacuuming up all this wealth and then spending it have their po political agenda that's being met while they're spending it, even if some good works may be being done by that. That's not the way we should be. We shouldn't be funding our our health care and our other needed things because rich people deem it necessary to do so. Um, Ah, humbug. Yes, well, I, it's, it's perfectly appropriate, it seems to me, particularly as the uh, Congress, after having uh, uh, passed a uh, rich person's tax bill uh, and having it signed by the president today, uh, is uh, now announced that it's going to deal with entitlements. Entitlements uh, are a, a word of art of the American capitalist class uh, that really needs to be uh, interpreted uh, for the, the majority of American voters. Uh, it's based on the notion that uh, the uh, programs such as Social Security and uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, that uh, are the slight uh, um, gestures in the direction of uh, social responsibility are somehow gifts from the rich to the, uh, uh, the needy uh, facilitated by the government. Um, entitlements, uh, how, uh, pronounced with a faint sneer, uh, is an attempt to say that uh, uh, these things are deserved, that people have a right to support. Uh, the sort of thing that has gone much farther, for, of course, in other 
capitalist democracies, uh, but uh, not in our country for reasons that have to do with the uh, brilliance of uh, the American ruling class in making sure uh, that uh, the wealth of the country concentrates in their hands. Uh, and indeed, they've done very well indeed. Uh, for the last 40 years, there has been an accelerating concentration of wealth in those hands and the claims of the populace at large to that wealth for its own purposes have gone uh, uh, only um, uh, slightly recognized uh, by the American ascendancy. Uh, there's more to come on that story. That's going to be a real issue uh, in the coming years as the Republicans in the Congress see their chance to seize back uh, these pittances that have been doled out to the population at large. It's a fight, a fight worth having, and we should do it by calling things by their right names, not by covering them with, yeah. covering sin with smooth uh, names. It's, it's a fairly subtle, nuanced process by which the words entitlement has acquired that connotation yeah. that you refer to, because it's a perfectly good word. It, it should be sort of syn synonymous with, with rights, with human rights, right. with basic rights with the things that everyone is entitled to. Exactly. Like being loved by their parents and being well-fed and all that kind of stuff. But then again, all Housing, these things- Housing, medical care, yeah, sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, all these things right. are up, up, for, up for grabs now. And, um, and the, word, the word entitlement. Um, and in, you know, in specific terms, it's basically a, applied to, of course, two or three federal programs, which, which constitute a good chunk, 30, 40% of or maybe maybe half or more of the, the federal budget, Social Security, Medicare, and 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 you know Medi, Me, you know Medicaid. Um, Me, Med, Medicaid is perhaps the most vulnerable of those programs because it's directed at the you know the poor and right. especially poor children. And now we see that health care payment for for the health care of poor children is being put in doubt by various ver, various very various things that are going on in the you know the Congress. Uh, that 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 are hard to kind of scope out, but just sort of well, it can't be it can't be helped. There's no money. There's no this. There's a, there, there you know there's no that. So, um, but um, the question is, I mean, you're 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 being a little harder on the Republicans than I I would I would you know to the exclusion of Democrats right. that I would expect you to be. So maybe you want to respond to. Uh, <laughs> what the Democrats' role is in all this, because I don't necessarily see them as, I mean, they, they, they obviously didn't vote for this tax cut bill, but, but the question was, A, yes. what are they for, well, and B, what were they for when they, when they were in power, yes, especially, exactly. especially when they were in control of both the, the White House and the, you know, the Congress during the, at least the first two years precisely. of the, of the first Obama ad, ad, you know, administration from in 2009 and 2010. They didn't vote for the tax bill because they didn't have to. Republicans were taking <laughs> care of it for them. Uh, under other, other circumstances, uh, you, the yeah. Democrats who are working for the same people, yeah. working for the 1% and not the 1% who voted in the UN, but another 1%, uh, the Democrats who voted for the 1% have been instrumental in making sure that the uh, tax uh, structure of the United States has changed markably over a generation, or well, actually two generations, uh, in favor of the rich. And this uh, recent bill is another step in that direction. Um, uh, people have said that, well, this is the biggest change in American taxes, American tax structure, since the Reagan years. And in some sense, that's true, uh, because the Reagan administration uh, went on to uh, uh, reorganize uh, the corporate tax rates and the uh, uh, taxes of the rich in a way that resembles uh, the current bill. But what we forget is that the Reagan administration in the early 80s uh, was purposely, consciously, and directly imitating the Kennedy administration in the early 60s. Uh, this is a task, uh, this confiscation of uh, wealth from the community at large for the benefit of the few, uh, needs to be done uh, legislatively in America apparently every 20 years or so. Uh, so the uh, uh, 60s and the 80s uh, resemble in that sense uh, the present uh, decade in terms of um, this sort of reorganization. Uh, it 
depends on other factors as to which party gets to do the job. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that the, uh, if the Republicans had not done the job now, uh, the Democrats would have, and the Republicans are in charge of the Congress, therefore it was up to them. Uh, and the, the, the notion that um, uh, we have a uh, popular party uh, that is standing up for people's rights, standing up for entitlement, entitlements, standing up for taxing the rich uh, is ludicrous. Uh, it's pure pop propaganda. And the only reason that I talked about the Republican tax bill this time yeah. is that the Republicans are in charge of Congress. Yeah. This so, time. The, so central to this tax cut is the corporate tax cut yes. from like 35% to 21%, although who knows what that really means in the context of how much corporations have ended up paying and will, and will end up paying. But of course the, the debate has been around whether the, tax, the corporate tax cut will result in co corporations investing in oh, new, new equipment and new jobs and so forth. And even, and I was surprised to find out this out, there are even people who are apparently have argued, I just found out in the last day or two, that if you give, if you give a corporate tax cut, that workers' pay might actually rise, that some of that tax cut, some of that tax savings from those cuts will go directly into workers' pockets in their pay, aside from what, whatever minor tax cut most workers will be getting from the other part of this, of this tax bill. And I was surprised to, to find out that anybody even argues that or believes that for one second. Because it's so that silly. The, the, the corporations would just sort of, oh, it's, uh, you know, Merry, you know Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas, Happy New right. Year's, here's a few more dollars in your paycheck because our tax rate went down from 35% to, to 20, 21%. Who believes that? But apparently somebody... It, it recently, somebody that I read in the last day or two, you know, critiquing this tax bill, felt they had to to point out that that just wasn't go going to happen. And of course, I didn't even realize the proponents would even of this would even claim that. Yes, and we've realized for a century in the U.S. that uh, the uh, engine of economic growth uh, is <clears throat> not uh, low interest rates. The engine of economic growth is demand. Man. Uh, it's people wanting to buy the things that the corporate uh, uh, structure is producing. Uh, and the only way to do that is to make sure that there is enough money in the community uh, to buy those things. Uh, aggregate demand, it's called. That is the uh, wishes of a, of a lar large group of people to purchase products. Uh, how do you produce aggregate demand? Uh, this was obvious even in the Great Depression. You produce aggregate demand by uh, giving people money, by get, making sure that people have enough money to buy things. But that, of course, is something that the uh, uh, economic structure doesn't want to do. I expect to find a um, renewed discussion of uh, uh, uni a universal basic income uh, after it becomes clear just how much the progressive lowering of taxes uh, on the wealthy over the last generation uh, has failed to uh, uh, stimulate economic growth. Uh, there's a real issue there, and sooner or later something will have to be done about it, and people will begin to demand it. Uh, it's happened elsewhere, uh, and I'm actually quite surprised at how much uh, discussion there has been of the matter, uh, not in the U.S. particularly, but in the capitalist world at large. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm coming around. I was, you know, in terms of universal basic income, I probably have not as been enthusiastic of, as you have been in recent years, but I'm coming around to the belief that the contradictions of capitalism are so profound and the lack of demand is the the willingness of capitalists to drain demand from the hands of workers and therefore exactly therefore heightening the the, con the contradictions of, 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 of capitalism are so profound and so and so built into the, the system that that it really nothing other than universal basic income can really can really address those things what sort of framework it 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 does that in is important whether it whether that is really a part of a socialistic framework in in other in other ways that's very but, true but but still uh, in and of itself universal basic income 
probably, I mean, we'll probably have to get into a, a pretty bad way before that actually happens. But I, I, I think that it, it is in and of itself important that it happen at, at some point. Well, and you can see, of course, why uh, the... Or like now, some point would be now. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't, you know, want to put it off too long. But you can see why the corporate economy, uh, or well, the economy of corporations, <laughs> the corporations don't want such a thing. Yeah. I mean, the... Yeah. Uh, 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 Profits of American corporations depend upon the facts they don't have to pay adequate wages. Uh, American wages have been flat since the 1970s. What neoliberalism has done, perhaps more importantly than anything else, uh, is stop that rise of wages along with productivity that occurred from the Second World War to the 1970s. That was producing the demands on the corporate economy that uh, the American business community didn't want and had to turn around uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, neoliberal policies. That was the most important issue. Uh, other things along the way aided that, including the destruction of unions, uh, the offshoring of production, where you go find a, a foreigner who'll work for less than uh, a worker in America. Uh, the other arrangements that were made by um, the American economy in the 1970s produced that flattening of wages um, and uh, produced uh, um, what was... Uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve's uh, phrase for it, for the uncomfortable worker, no, the... Uh, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. The, the, yeah, I know what you mean, but yeah, the, Alan Greenspan. The, work, yeah. the worker who did, yeah. did not, could not count on yeah, his wages right. uh, even continuing, much yeah. less rising. Yeah, right. And that was what, of course, produced, uh, and therefore was not involved in any sort of labor agitation, and that kept corporate profits up. But uh, that's, uh, keeping wages flat is a diminishing return, or produces diminishing returns for the American corporate structures because those flat wages can't buy the products that are produced by the corporations. Therefore, at some point, the uh, uh, American economy has got to solve the demand problem, and so far they haven't found a way yeah, to do it. Well, I, I would complicate what, what you just said by saying that there is a way for workers to buy what, what they produce or what people in other countries produce without having the money, and that is, of course, by going into debt. Yes, And that creates, oh, exactly. uh, that creates the, the credit, card, credit card industry and the, the whole mortgage, the whole uh, subprime mortgage industry that, that led us into 2008, and, and the sort of, you know, the, all of the, the aspect, the, the, the student loan crisis, and all of the things that, that, uh, that people, not only can, can, can corporations get people to consume, What's, who don't have the money, um, they can go into debt for it, and then the the you know, financial aspects of those of those institutions, whether they be the the, the sort of in-house financing of of cars and so forth, or more 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 um, more commonly the the banks, the, the major banks, they can get all that all that uh, all that interest on worker debts. But that of course even puts the whole system at more at more you know, systemic risk. What's called a Minsky moment yes. in the in the in the economics literature, where the the, wor the workers the working class goes so much into debt that they they just can't buy anymore. You have a crash like you did in two thousand eight, and then you have something called debt debt deflation, and uh, there there isn't that you get back to having a real lack lack of lack of demand because at that point workers. Working families won't even borrow any any anymore, but on the other side of that ledger, you've got all this money that's going to be being floating around in the, the corporations, which could be used to put people to work. But people are arguing, who I believe are are correct, this this will more likely be converted into stock stock dividends or to stock buybacks, which raise the, the you know the prices of of. Of, of stock, and so you can you continue this sort of contradictory cycle that that goes on, and one what some people are arguing, and I don't know, I, I don't you know I don't know sometimes how much to believe some of these things that the the whole Bitcoin you know, pheno you know phenomenon where people are putting their money into the speculative speculative commodity you can't even call it currency yet but the speculative commodity. Uh, 
are doing this in such a way as to pump up the price of, of Bitcoin. And, that, and that, that, will, that will inevitably, as some people argue, uh, will, will, will crash. And then that there'll be maybe other side effects in the, in the other aspects of, of the economy when the people who are, who are suffering from that crash you know, as these these things kind of move out into other other areas. So what I think, I think probably the most important aspect of this tax cut bill is the the, the consequences of what's going to be happening with all this speculative money that people still expect to get their four or five or six or eight percent returns on that money with with an economy that that you know, isn't doing doing too well and how that's going to actually play out. So that so um, again, I mean, nobody can really call a bubble. Nobody can really call when the speculative bubble is going to burst. But I think more and more people are saying that there's going to be a higher risk of that given given these tax cuts beyond just all the economic inequality that goes along with this tax cut and the fact that the basic needs of this you know, society the things that this tax cut, if there was a tax cut, should be being spent on, like 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 inf you know, infrastructure and and you know and so forth, um, that's not happening. Where is the money going to go? Uh, stay tuned. You will hear more about this as the new year uh, proceeds and the ambiguous position of the uh, Trump administration on these matters uh, may turn out to uh, uh, be interesting. Uh, we Do I have... see a silver lining coming here? No, no <laughs> silver lining. I have no, well, maybe, maybe a gold lining if okay. uh, the currency, I, okay. uh, world currency moves towards the gold-backed currencies of the East. That's yeah. A, yeah. the international economic structure of the, uh, yeah. of, of the situation that we haven't even alluded to, and that may indeed uh, force uh, some changes in uh, in in the U.S. because the forms of profit that the uh, uh, American one percent have been taking abroad uh, may themselves uh, change substantially. And uh, as usual in that case, uh, as the old proverb is supposed to have said, the deficit will be divided among the pe peasants. Uh, so if you consider yourself uh, an economic peasant, watch out. You're listening to uh, news from Neptune. Uh, I would like to turn to a, another uh, matter, uh, not unrelated, in fact, to the economic questions we've been talking about, but uh, different uh, in a way. Uh, there was an article in the Guardian newspaper, a very equivocal, an equivocal journal in all sorts of ways, uh, this week uh, about an American author called Mark Lilla. Uh, he is uh, an academic uh, and a literary scholar more than anything else. Uh, he has spent much of his almost four-decade career trafficking in a certain kind of hyper-scholarly intellectual debate. That's what The Guardian says about him, and that's about right. His witty, densely argued essays usually find a natural readership in places like the New York Review of Books or the Chronicle of Higher Education. Then, 10 days after the presidential election, last November, you heard about it, uh, Lilla, a Columbia professor of humanities, published a New York Times op-ed entitled The End of Identity Liberalism. It became the Times' most read political op-ed of the year. Hey, they know things like that, huh? Uh, and marked his transition from academic and they know every, They know everything about you. Yeah, there we are. An occasional public intellectual to polemicist. Well, that's a, that's a little heated, even for The Guardian, but, it's just, but it, it was significant. Addressed to liberal Democrats, there are supposed to be such things, you know, the op-ed was both a call to arms and a rebuke. Trump's accession, accession to the White House Lilla argued, was a backlash against an obsession with identity politics on the part of the American left. That's almost true. American liberalism, he wrote, has slipped into a kind of moral panic, I'm not quite sure that's what I would call it, about racial, gender, and sexual identity that has distorted liberalism's message and prevented it from becoming a unifying force capable of governing. Well, I don't think that's quite what happened. Uh, the uh, moral panic was rather a uh, craven adaption 
of identity politics by a liberalism that has given up the class politics that characterized American liberalism from the New Deal through the 1970s. Uh, that's the great change, the watershed that produced the flat wages we were talking about a moment ago. But the cover for it, the intellectual cover for it, uh, was identity politics, a concern for uh, those left out in society on the basis of race, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, or some other uh, personal characteristic. Uh, in August, August of this past year, Little doubled down on this argument with a book, The Once and Future Liberal, quote, uh, colon, you always have to have a colon in a book title if you're an academic, <laughs> The Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics, a short book and his first for a popular audience, i.e., not for the New York Review of Books, although we could argue about that too. Um, the Guardian notes in the most important uh, line in the article that Macomb County, Michigan, Lilla's birthplace just outside Detroit, was one of the Rust Belt counties that voted twice for Obama before voting for Trump rather than Clinton. In other words, for the, uh, the elections of 2008-2012, uh, this Rust Belt County, well, the author is from, uh, uh, voted for the Democrat, voted, for elected, uh, uh, voted to elect uh, Barack Obama to office, uh, but when uh, 2016 came around, uh, they voted for the Republican. They didn't vote for Obama's obvious successor, Hillary Clinton, a fact which complicates the progressive white lash thesis that Trump voters were motivated by racial resentment. Uh, more than complicates it, it shows how false it is, uh, that that was the only reason that people voted for Trump was because they're racists and deplorables of the sort that the Democrats said. No, the reasons that people voted for Trump uh, were the same reasons they voted for Obama in uh, the uh, American Midwest. Uh, they voted for hope and change. They voted for a, uh, a recapture of the economic uh, uh, possibilities that their parents had enjoyed. They voted to make America great again, by which they meant the understanding of the economic circumstances uh, that they had been told to expect and that somehow had been confiscated by the era of neoliberalism. Uh, the Democrats, of course, couldn't mention it because they were just as responsible for it, as you were pointing out. Uh, so they had to say, well, no, these, the people who voted for Trump were deplorables, they were racist, they were misogynists, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, are, are, are nasty, nasty folks who have to be uh, essentially excluded from the democratic process because they're voting for the wrong reasons. Well, the fact of the matter is that that wasn't their reason. The desperate attempt to blame the election of Trump on racism and or misogyny shows that identity politics is a cover for liberals' abandonment of class politics. Its real source is the immiseration of the American middle class and the confiscation of their life chances in comparison with their parents over 40 years of accelerating growth of inequality. Liberals dec decry discrimination in order not to have to talk about exploitation. And the exploitation is coming along very nicely, thank you. Uh, the only difficulty is that uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, electorate is uh, getting wise. Uh, it seems to me that there is a, uh, uh, an important lesson here in what Lilla's book is not uh, uh, unquestionable. It's uh, a, a um, realization uh, of the fundamental nature of neoliberalism and of identity politics as a cover for neoliberalism, uh, but it doesn't really uh, suggests the proper cure, which is the restoration of class politics uh, to the tradition of American liberalism in, in place of uh, the identity politics uh, that's uh, all the rage. Yeah, I, I read over some of that this morning as it was flying around in, 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 on, the, on the aware list. Um, and I'm a little confused about Mark Lilla because a few months ago, or maybe a year ago, it seems that you were not 
you were not impressed with something he wrote of a similar vein, or maybe it was something different. But you know, regardless of that, um, where is Lilla coming from in, in his critique of, 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 of identity politics? I mean, you re he doesn't seem to identify with the people that you or we usually refer to in their critiques of, of identity politics, people like Walter Ben Michaels and Adolf Reed and, and so forth, or the Field sisters, right. Barbara and Barbara and Karen Fields, uh, from in in their in their in their writings about especially race and and class, it doesn't seem like Lilla's coming from there. I tend to identify him more. Um, your your friend from Harvard, Todd Todd Gitlin, has <laughs> uh -huh. about twenty years ago, twenty five years ago, wrote a book which kind of uh, from the quote unquote left. Or yes. from his understanding of you know the left, you know, decried the ri the rise of the rise of identity politics, but not from a radical perspective, not from a Marxist perspective, not even maybe from a, a class class based per, you know, perspective, but not but not anything that really really convinced me that he what that that Todd Gitlin was actually advocating for profound structural changes. And the question is: Is is Mark Lilla being like that, or is he being? I mean, is he being a kind of a kind of con, you know controversialist in in this in this context, or is he really has he really sort of gone left? And I know you don't like to use the terms right and left, perhaps in this in this context, but is he really identifying identify him identifying himself with people who who promote structural, radical structural changes, as well as promote um, a very different U.S. foreign policy that would, would go along with that. I, I, don't, I don't quite know where Lilla is coming from because of this sort of literary approach that he mm. takes. And I, I'm having some of the same, I mean, someone like Corey Robin, who writes about some of these same things, about the conservative mind and this and that, um, it's always there's something squishy about it also in yes. terms of the way he looks. So I'm kind of confused and sort of uh, that's a lot to put on the you know the table. But the short answer to your question, David, is no, he's not. I'm <laughs> making him look better than he actually is. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I, I mean, and, yeah. and I'll take the, yeah. take the sentence that that the Guardian quote. Uh, first of all, I think it's interesting that the argument has found its way into the pages of the Guardian yeah. because the Guardian, uh, the leading British. Uh, newspaper that has a, a very peculiar uh, uh, history uh, and background, and today is uh, an awful uh, cover for the worst excesses of British and American policy while pretending to be liberal. So the, the point that you make, and the comparison with the uh, ex-head of SDS at uh, uh, the University for the Passive and Obedient, as uh, Noam Chomsky calls it many years ago, that is Todd Gitlin, uh, is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, Lilla is a sign here of the way in which uh, the liberal arguments are breaking down. And it's, a re it's a, uh, an example of the way things have got to go. Uh, the, que the line that I quoted from Lilla, that the Guardian quoted from Lilla, American liberalism has slipped into a kind of moral panic about racial, gender, and sexual identity that has distorted liberalism's message and prevented it from becoming a unifying force capable of governing. Now, <laughs> there's a faint recognition of what's happened there, but it's so uh, cosseted in a, in, 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 uh, mis misinterpretation and misunderstandings uh, that it's up to us to uh, uh, unpack well, it. Is there th the danger given of the whole Macomb County thing? I assume that's you're talking somebody who's from a place that used to have good auto industry jobs right. and perhaps doesn't anymore right. or, or far fewer. Um, are you in danger of sort of lapsing into the idea that the good old days when there was a white working class, and the idea was for everybody, there was a white working class that had become a kind of middle class, or at least uh, a middle, you know, that had middle class, uh, a middle class lifestyle that it, that uh, should be that could be aspired to, as the various civil rights movement, you know, got their educational opportunity, got their got on their on their stairs up to a, a better a better life. 
as opposed to all of these sidetracks with race and gender and and so on and so forth. Is is there a chance that that Lilla is just kind of has this dream of a, of a future rooted in the the dream the Macomb County dream that was betrayed by you know neo neoliberalism glo globalization and all that all that other stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's, I'm asking uh, long questions. You're no, giving but, me short answers. Yeah, well, but. <laughs> because because what you say uh, uh, is yeah. essentially correct. What we see here is a step in the direction of the critique of the absolutely untenable identity politics thesis yeah. that the Democrats ran the last presidential election on. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, what I'm concerned to do is to point out uh, the uh, difference between uh, the two lefts, if you like, in this country right now. Uh, two lefts, uh, and as you say, I don't like using the term because it is so difficult to distinguish them, but the two lefts have radically different analyses of what the problem of American politics and economy is. Uh, and the fact that we lump, lump them together and call them the left yeah. makes it very difficult to carry on a good critique. What Lilla has done here is by uh, seeing that the confusion of the two lefts exists, uh, he has suggested it's got to be cleared up. He hasn't gone very far about how to clear it up, yeah. and that's why uh, I, I think it's so wrong for him to say that American liberalism slipped into a kind of moral panic and got upset about uh, 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 identity. That's not what happened. What it did was, as I said a moment ago, craven, cravenly took up uh, questions of identity because it ab abandoned questions of class. That's what the 1970s were about, and that's what liberals, like the ones you've mentioned, have been doing all along. Uh, this is hope springing <clears throat> eternal and saying people are to say, yeah, there's something wrong with that. And uh, we're here to tell them what is wrong with that. Uh, the difficulty, the two lefts, if you like, divide on what the explanation for American inequality is. Uh, American inequality in its peculiar nature is what elected Trump. But American inequality uh, is a um, uh, growing factor in American society. Uh, we talked a week ago or so about the Gini Index and the way in which equality uh, of wealth, inequality of wealth can be financially represented, uh, sorry, not financially, mathematically represented. Uh, and uh, that's important and worthwhile, but what it shows us when we begin looking at the numbers is that a, the American society is far less equal today, or to put it more appropriately, inequality is far greater today than it was before the advent of neoliberalism, than it was during the 60s, say. Fifty years ago, American inequality uh, was nowhere near so great as it is today, and by inequality I mean different access to resources from the top and the bottom of the population. Uh, the, what, the situation that led us to coin the phrase, the one percent. Uh, inequality is far greater uh, in 2017 than it was in 1967. Uh, that is a, fun a fundamental pa part of the present political situation. But now what's happened on the left is that two explanations grew up for why inequality was so much greater and indeed accelerating today, that was the important of Thomas Piketty's book uh, on capital in the 21st century, uh, it's accelerating and so forth. The American political left came up, the, the left, no, we're not talking about left versus right here, we're talking about the American political left came up with two explanations about why this was happening. The first explanation uh, was that uh, groups had been left out. People had been discriminated against. Look at the average income of blacks in America as opposed to the average income of whites, and you see that blacks are being discriminated against and are not given a full chance to succeed the way whites are. 
And by the way, that's also true for women. Look at the wages of women as opposed to the wages of men. That's because women are discriminated against in the, market, in, in, in the workplace. Uh, again and again, other groups uh, identified by various characteristics uh, were nominated for uh, dis for um, uh, econ a position of economic inequality uh, owing to discrimination. Well, now, that explanation had some attraction because, of course, there is discrimination in society. There really is such thing. But the notion that if we overcome discrimination, then we have an economic structure in which everybody has a fair chance uh, is, frankly, nonsense. And the reason it's nonsense is, is because of the other explanation given by the other part of the left for American inequality. That's exploitation. That's the account of the nature of capitalism that goes back to the old man in the British Museum. That's an account of capitalism that says the point of capital is to extract surplus value, that is the value of the work done from the workers, and make that redound to the credit, literally and figuratively, of the owners, the owner class. We began speaking of the 1% and saw that the increasing exploitation of American labor, uh, of American workers, of Americans in general, uh, from the 1970s, the increasing exploitation was the reason for the increasing inequality. And that the Democratic Party, which from the days of Roosevelt on, uh, had said, yes, we have got to try to uh, find ways like Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, things like this, to lessen the impact of that uh, economic exploitation, make it, uh, to make it not hurt so much. They gave that up and, uh, and turned to the other explanation, the folks who were saying that, no, no, if you really want to deal with inequality, you've got to deal with exploitation, were still there. But uh, that was a dangerous talk that cannot be encompassed within the uh, uh, American political system. There were some people, not, not, not stupid, who suggested that the actual direction of the Trump administration should be in taking up, uh, should be taking up that point again. They pointed out that Trump was the first major party political candidate in 40 years who actually attacked the principles of neoliberalism and the, 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 the moves to increase exploitation, uh, and that he did so in a way that attacked, attracted voters in Macomb County and elsewhere, and in fact made him president. Uh, people had all sorts of motives for voting for Trump, certainly, but that was one of them, uh, and that was important. And it was said that, of course, if Trump wants to be reelected, he should note that what the motives were of those people who voted uh, for Obama and then didn't vote for Clinton. And it was the recognition of exploitation uh, that was at stake there, and that was what the Trump administration should deal with. In fact, it seems they've not. It seems they've gone in just the other direction. Trump happily signs the tax bill, uh, which increases exploitation, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, Three, three points. Um, one is just a, a sort of li uh, you know a, a footnote is that uh, the, the very good economist Alan Nasser, who doesn't write that frequently, but when he does is very worth reading uh, on Counterpunch, has an article up this morning up near the top of the page. You can't miss it, which really summarizes the most recent recent Piketty et al. report on global in inequality in, in income and and wealth, and really, ex you know, there's many ways, many things you can read that encompass uh, that, those, those points, but I think Alan Nasser uh, summarizes them in a very, in a very cogent way. Um, a second point, I've been having a lot of problems lately with the use of the word, of the word, of the word oppression in, in the, the panoply of words that are used to describe various things. It seems like the word, the word oppression has taken up a place as somewhere between Dis discrimination and exploitation. Mm -hmm. It's become a kind of a weasel word oh, I see. in identity uh -huh. politics. I could be wrong about mm -hmm. that, but I'm keeping my eye on that word because it seems to me has become the kind of go-to word in the context of identity politics. And I'm wondering 
uh, it, it seems like a better word to describe the way capitalism treats people, but I'm not sure if it's being used in a in a radical, critical context that is as clear as the word exploitation mm -hmm. is being used as, exactly. as you use it. And the other thing, I guess getting back to Mark Lilla and the whole thing, the question, the practical question becomes, is Mark Lilla and perhaps Todd Gitlin as well still identified with the Democratic Party, and in fact, are the Democratic Socialists, the the D, you know the DSA, who sponsored a rally that we 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 attended this past Saturday, are they still identified with the Democratic Party? Um, you know, is Lilla telling us that there was a Democratic Party in the 1960s that was on the right track? until it got sidetracked by identity politics and, of course, the Vietnam War and all this kind of stuff. And when McGovern was defeated in 1972, you know, the, the, whole, the whole argument about how, how the popular forces that took over the Democratic Party in 1972 and nom nominated McGovern and who was roundly defeated by Richard Nixon, and it's been downhill ever since. And then, at, before you know it, the the Democratic Leadership Council has taken over the the, Demo, the, you know, the Democratic Party. Uh, how, how is all this? How is all this playing out in terms of? Uh, do we still? Uh, I, I think a serious question is how much effort do we put it in reforming the, the Democratic Party, if that's even possible, which seems to have fewer and fewer adherents uh, in in ideas, but on on the ground. We're still living in a we're still living in a progressive community here, which has in, by no means lost its faith in the you know the the the, the, Demo, you know, the Democratic Party. I think one way to <laughs> illustrate this question, um, and, and I think you're quite right about talking uh, talking about the ambiguities that are being read into the word oppression, uh, uh, is oppression. A, result, a matter of what somebody else thinks of me, their attitudes towards me, they hate me because I'm a white southerner or anything else, uh, is that oppression? Or is oppression a, a, a structure of uh, economic uh, life, uh, of employment? La uh, of labor, yes. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it seems to me that the confusion of those, which is basic to the notion of these two lefts we've been talking about, uh, is uh, occluded by the, by the word oppression. Uh, blacks are oppressed in America. Uh, well, that doesn't sound quite right anymore. That, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it is, it is, and it's not. It I depends mean, on what you mean by yeah, oppression. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly, as you say. I, think I mean, it's worse right. than oppression. Uh-huh. You know? Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let, let's turn the, uh, 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 the question to um, uh, how these two lefts, uh, uh, a left based on discrimination and a left based on exploitation, uh, how these two lefts uh, react to uh, war. Uh, people have said for a while now, what happened to the left anti-war movement? Uh, Obama was the first American president ever to be at war throughout two presidential terms, carried on eight wars around the world, uh, produced the world's greatest uh, uh, terrorist program, uh, as Noam Chomsky called it, uh, the drone assassinations, and the left, the ambiguity of left is what I want to talk about, the left didn't really oppose him that much. Whatever became of the left anti-war movement? Well, think about those two notions of left that we've suggested. If the left uh, is uh, says uh, the problem in society is discrimination, uh, it's a rather hard to make the case that it's discrimination, the fact we don't like Arabs or we don't like Muslims and so forth, is the reason that the U.S. is killing people in the Middle East. If the left is in instead uh, based on opposition to exploitation, it's very easy to see how the Western, primarily American, exploitation of the Middle East leads to the uh, uh, the hostilities that have been conducted by America and the Middle East for uh, uh, several uh, administrations now. Um, and uh, the explanation 
the uh, explanation of the left as uh, opposition to discrimination doesn't get you very, very far in explaining why the war is going on at all. But if we think about the left being exposed to exploitation, it's very easy indeed to see that exploitation is the reason for the war. Questions or comments? <laughs> You're not happy with that. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not unhappy with it. No, that's, that's fine. I don't know if there's time, but I just wanted to refer at least to a kind of confusing and you know, perplexing interview that Vijay, Pras Vijay Prashad did on the uh -huh. Real News Network in which he talks about Trump's security strategy, which I think we're going to have to probably leave to some other time. But just, I guess, briefly, um, this idea of principled realism, you know, the idea that there has to be a Trump doctrine, that every president has to have this, this have doctrine. doctrine right. So they put forward this page, this page which v Vijay Prashad said, I read the whole 60 pages. I, just, I didn't just listen to what Trump had to say about it. And, and takes this notion of principled realism pretty seriously. And um, just to quote um, what, what, you know, this is maybe a little out of context, but what Prashad said, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm on board with this at all, he says, so in a way, unlike the documents produced by the Obama and, 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 and Bush, Bush administration, this is the first defensive document that I've seen, and a document that is from, from a position of defensiveness, or what they call principled realism, arguing that the United States needs to rebuild its military and use mostly military power to challenge the rise of Russia and China. Um, again, that's a little out of context. Yes, but Do you, did you make anything out of Trump's security, out of this Trump's uh, document about this Trump doctrine, or is it just pretty much same old, same old? Is there, is there any there there? Well, I think you're right. We have to examine it a little more closely and put it in the context of the forthcoming documents having to do with a nuclear and uh, other strategic uh, uh, positions uh, of the American government. I thought one of the most interesting comments about uh, Trump's presentation of this, as you say, 60-page national security strategy document uh, was that it was so perfunctory. Uh, Trump was given a, uh, a, a script and said, "Oh, by the way, we got a we got a we got a, secure, a strategic document here. Uh, get a copy on your way out." Um, <laughs> I think what that suggests is the uh, the, the the peculiar the uh, uh, unsureness within the administration of how to deal with it. But we'll have to take that up next week, and I think that should be our our concern for our first program in the new year, assuming a beneficent providence allows us well, to. Well, are we? Are, are we doing next week, or is oh, that well, in two Oh, well, our weeks? Next, next program. Okay, weeks. whatever. It may be New Year, it may not be. You've been watching news from <laughs> Neptune for the 51st week of 2017. Maybe the old, same old year. Presented by Carl Estabrook and David Green, produced and directed by Jason Leggett and Ethan Young. Inshallah, we'll be back next week. We're, we don't or know. We'll year. figure it out. Or next year. <laughs> we'll be, next week or next year. Uh, with a new edition of news from Neptune. Hey, we're going to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer, as U.S. Grant said. <laughs> <laughs> we're told we're told it in fact will be next week i hope so i hope so uh our job is to remind you in the words of edward devere what's past is prologue what to come and yours and my discharge even if we're not on the air in the meantime confusion your enemies merry christmas to all and to all a good and night if you, and if you if you join us next week we'll have we'll have we'll have you know champagne for 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 all of you really yeah everybody gets champagne uh-huh all right. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>